So Chris Eubank Jr. beats the brakes off James DeGale en route to a 12-round unanimous decision to become the IBO super middleweight world champion once again. Let's talk about it. Right off the bat, it became very apparent from early in the fight that James DeGale was absolutely shot to pieces. Now, of course, many people have been saying this prior to this fight. Many people have been saying that James DeGale hasn't been the same since the Badu Jack fight, that that fight took a hell of a lot out of him. And that may well be true. But for me, this was the worst version of James DeGale I've ever seen, even worse than the version who fought Caleb Truax. And he did take punishment in both Truax fights, particularly the first one. So that would have put Miles on the clock as well. And obviously he's taking punishment in sparring and training camp. That would have put more Miles on the clock. Now, why do I say he looks shot to pieces? Well, first of all, his punch resistance appeared to be totally shot. James DeGale's always had a pretty good chin. But here against Chris Eubank Jr., every time Eubank Jr. landed clean, James DeGale was in trouble. With that being said, the first time James DeGale touched the canvas, it actually wasn't called a knockdown because Eubank Jr. went boring in and he actually hit James DeGale with the top of his head in DeGale's face. Okay, so the top of Eubank Jr.'s head in DeGale's face and that hurt DeGale. He took a knee from that headbutt, if you want to call it that, although I think it was probably unintentional. And I think it was later on in that same round, DeGale went down from shots to the head. Uh, they haven't yet updated the box rick situation here, people, to show that Eubank Jr. won, because I was checking to see what round that knockdown was in. But it was in one of the early rounds, the knockdown occurred, uh, the first knockdown of the fight. And yeah, DeGale's punch resistance seemed seriously diminished compared to what we've seen before. And his timing was totally off. There was no rhythm to his work. He kept on lunging in constantly. And that's something James DeGale has always done, by the way. James DeGale has always liked to lunge in with shots. The difference here, however, is that when he was lunging in with that left hand, he was hardly ever landing it. And it's not as if Chris Eubank Jr. was moving his head out of the way. It's just James DeGale's timing and his judgment of distance was totally off. If you remember the Andre Durrell fight, when he dropped Durrell, it was from a punch like that, where he, I think, threw a right jab to the body and then he lunged in with the left hand over the top and dropped him. So that's something that James DeGale's done throughout his career. But because his timing was so badly off in this fight, he just ended up lunging and clinching, lunging and clinching. There was nothing landing. So timing totally off, rhythm totally off, sense of distance, you know, his depth perception and sense of distance was totally off. Punch resistance not there. He looked absolutely awful tonight. But as far as Chris Eubank Jr., there were some improvements there. First of all, he looked a lot less nervous on the ring walk for this fight than he did against George Groves. Against George Groves, he looked petrified to me when I saw him standing on that, uh, you know, the thing they had him standing on when he walked to the uh, ring against George Groves for the World Boxing Super Series. It's not just a straight ring walk. They make you stand on some kind of platform um, halfway towards the ring and then all these pyrotechnic this pyrotechnic display goes up and then after that you go to the ring and when I looked at him standing on that platform he looked nervous as hell before the Groves fight but here against the Gale he, he still looked a little tense but far less nervous than he looked against Groves so he was less nervous this time around and the Gale lunging in helped Eubank Jr. from a stylistic point of view because against Groves, Groves wasn't lunging in. Groves was forcing Eubank to come forward because Groves was the boss at long range with the jab and, you know, being able to get proper extension on his right hand, whereas Eubank can't get proper extension on his right hand and didn't have any kind of jab to speak of in a Groves fight. Whereas the Gale was helping Eubank out 
by lunging in and that's where some of Eubank's early success came from. When De Gea lunged in, Eubank was able to catch him with uppercuts and hooks as he was coming in. So a very poor move for James De Gale to be making, right? <laughs> giving Eubank Jr. chances that you don't need to be giving him. Should have kept it long, should have not been lunging, should have been throwing the left hand from long. But why wasn't he ever throwing the left hand from long? Why was he every single time he threw the left hand lunging or just about every time? There was a couple times, to be fair, he did throw it from long range. But more often than not, he was lunging and looping the left hand and it just was not effective. And it became extremely annoying, actually, uh, because he was lunging in and grabbing and holding. And later on in the fight, Eubank Jr. got so frustrated with it, he actually picked James DeGill up and dumped him to the canvas and he got a point deducted for that when really and truly James De Gea was fortunate to not get a point deducted for his constant uh, holding and leaning on against Chris Eubank Jr. But yeah, that uh, lunging in helped Chris Eubank Jr., particularly early in the fight because it was close, you know, De Gea was closing the distance for him. You see, that's what Eubank Jr. needs to do to be at his most effective against a slick boxer is have the distance closed and De Gale was doing that job for him. So Eubank just had to stand there, time it right and let off uppercuts and hooks when De Gale came in. So that was going on. Also, when Chris Eubank Jr. did go forward, his footwork was a little better this time than it was against Groves. And he also picked his spots to attack a lot better. Now, again, De Gale's reflexes were totally off. So the shots that were landing against De Gale were the kind of shots that weren't landing against Groves. All right, that has to be said, because Groves, even though he was, you know, probably slightly on the decline himself, he was nowhere near as badly over the hill as James DeGale was. I think we can probably all agree on that. DeGale's reflex is totally gone. So Eubank was throwing these shots, although the, the shots that Eubank was throwing from outside were not as wild as the shots he was throwing against uh, Groves, okay, for various different reasons. One, because Groves was keeping his distance better and moving his feet out of range when Eubank started the shot. Uh, but also because, as I say, I think Eubank wasn't as panicked in this fight as he was against uh, De Gale. He got a very bad cut, uh, sorry, against Groves. He got a very bad cut in the Groves fight and he was bleeding profusely. This time around, he did have a slight nick, but that was much later in the fight and it was nothing particularly bad. So I just feel like Eubank was in a much more comfortable space mentally in this fight from the very beginning. And that allowed him to perform better. Not that it, he would have beaten George Groves if he'd performed like this against Groves. He probably would have still lost. But he definitely revealed more of himself uh, tonight. Was picking his spots to attack much better than he previously had. Wasn't wasting so many punches. And as I say, every time he landed clean... James DeGale was in all sorts of trouble. And Eubank, with that relentless attack, that high energy attack, and he, we know he's tremendously physically fit. You know, whatever you say about Chris Eubank Jr., whether you like him or hate him, or whether you rate him as a fighter or think he's massively overrated, we all have to agree that the guy's got tremendous fitness, right? He's very, very physically fit. And we saw that again in this fight because his attacks were relentless. Whenever he got James DeGale hurt, he would just pile on the pressure and DeGale would hold and hold and hold. So the first knockdown was a combination of shots, which uh, put James DeGale down. He took a count. The second knockdown, which, which was much later on in the fight, from what I saw, it wasn't actually a knockdown and the referee called it wrongly. James DeGale went down to his haunches, basically, but his backside from what I saw, didn't touch the canvas and his gloves also didn't touch the canvas. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I saw watching it live. And, and when I saw the instant replay, I can't remember seeing his backside or his gloves touch the canvas. And to my uh, you know, knowledge, that is not actually a knockdown, but I can forgive the referee for thinking it was because it, you know, maybe from his angle looked like he did actually touch the canvas. Be that as it may, it was academic. Uh, James the Gale was getting battered most rounds from pillar to post was hardly landing anything i mean occasionally he'd get through with a left hand occasionally he'd get through with a, a right hook or something but he just couldn't hurt chris eubank jr the power wasn't enough to deter him 
And obviously that's something which uh, George Groves and his trainer Shane McGuigan talked about pre-fight. They said that Groves had power which Eubank respected and kept him honest and kept him from lunging in as frequently as he does against some fighters. Whereas with James DeGale, there was no deterrent there against Chris Eubank Jr. He just did not have the power or the accuracy either because most of his shots were missing. His timing was horrible. And again, yes, there were improvements from Eubank Jr., but the improvements weren't that vast. You know, he wasn't moving his head much, Eubank Jr., when he was coming in. He was picking his spots better, yes, but when James DeGale let shots fly, Somehow they were missing, even though Eubank Jr. wasn't really moving his head. He, there wasn't any serious lateral movement there. So DeGale's timing was just absolutely atrocious. And that really is the mark of a shot fighter. So I don't want to take anything away from Chris Eubank Jr. He beat the guy up. He turned up this time around. He did his thing. But James DeGale is so badly shot. And I, I really hope James DeGale is going to be okay. You know, I hope he goes to the hospital and gets checked out because he took an awful beating in the fight. And actually, after the 12 rounds, when the judges' scorecards were read out, I felt like they were too close. I felt like the scores should have been closer to what ITV had it. Um, James DeGale by, uh, sorry, Chris Eubank Jr. by how many rounds was it? Four or five rounds? I think they had him winning by. I think that's more accurate than, uh, I think a couple, one of the judges had is it Eubank Jr. by two rounds or three rounds? I thought that was absurd. And even more absurd than that was the fact that James DeGale, at the end of the fight, had his arm aloft. You know, he put his hand up as if he'd won. And even when they were reading out the scorecards, he had his arm up as if he'd won. Ridiculous. <laughs> you know, I know James DeGale's always been a glasses half full kind of character, but come on, man. If you've taken as terrible a beating as that, how on earth can you think you've won the fight? Crazy. Uh, so George Groves, James DeGale's amateur uh, rival and also amateur teammate, he called for James DeGale to retire. And disturbingly, even though James DeGale said if he couldn't beat Eubank, he would retire before the fight, after the fight in a post-fight interview, he didn't sound like he sound like he was going to follow through on his pre-fight pledge. He was saying, oh, I've got to go back and look at the tape and blah, blah, blah. He should have been straight talking about following through and what he said he was going to do and calling it a day. Because that guy is washed. He's finished. And if he carries on, he's going to get himself seriously hurt. Because I know some people are going to be impressed by Eubank Jr.'s performance. And it was a good performance, you know, by his standards. But if you're talking about, you know, the Benavides of the world, if you're talking about the Callum Smiths of the world, uh, et cetera, they are going to put a serious beating on this guy if he fights any of them. So, yeah, he, he needs to call it a day. He's been an Olympic champion. He's been a world champion and all that kind of business. Needs to knock it on the head before boxing becomes far too dangerous than it should be. You know, this guy has made millions. He's secured his family's future. Now it's all about securing his health. You know, don't give your health away. You've got all the money that you need. Retire before, you know, uh, boxing takes from something from you that you can never replace. So let me know what you guys think in the comments about Chris Eubank Jr., versus James DeGale. Did you see this, the fight the same way that I did? Um, it is a shame that we never saw Chris Eubank Jr. in there against a prime DeGale because it would have been a much more competitive fight. Uh, this fight really wasn't that competitive, people. <laughs> it was, I mean, early on, James DeGale landed a couple shots, I guess, but he pretty much got battered from pillar to post throughout the majority of the 12. So... Let me know what you guys feel anyway in the comments. I'm out. Join me on Patreon. I upload a minimum of two podcasts every single week covering a wide variety of controversial topics as well as live stream Q&A sessions. Take a look on screen right now at some of the podcasts I've produced so far. 
For just $3 a month, the equivalent of about £2 a month, you get access to all my new podcasts and my entire back catalogue of past podcasts, including my popular Confessions of a Nightclub Bouncer series. You can listen on your computer or on your smartphone or tablet by downloading the Patreon app from the Google Play Store or the App Store for free. The Patreon app also allows you to download each podcast in MP3. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to dozens of hours of exclusive content. It's easy to sign up, there's no contract, and you can cancel at any time. So come and join our community of free and critical thinkers by signing up with me here on Patreon today.